When we think of LGBTQ plus resistance, Stonewall often takes center stage. But what if I told you that three years earlier, before these iconic riots, on the other side of the U.S., another spark of defiance had already ignited? Picture a scorching August night in 1966, nestled in San Francisco's Tenderloin District, a community fought relentless harassment and discrimination. Tonight we unveil a story history nearly forgot, a rebellion that paved the way for LGBTQ plus rights. This is the often untold tale of Compton's Cafeteria Riot, a pivotal moment of resistance against frequent police harassment targeting drag queens and the trans community. Slightly before Stonewall, this riot blazed as one of the earliest LGBTQ plus uprisings in U.S. history. To truly understand what happened that night, we need to rewind a bit because this was no isolated incident. Gene Compton's cafeteria in San Francisco's Tenderloin District served as a gathering place for the transgender community. However, the Tenderloin itself was not without its challenges. In the early 1960s, the neighboring North Beach and South of Market both became targets of aggressive urban renewal projects. These areas, known for their vibrant working class and LGBTQ communities, were reshaped through intense policing and redevelopment, displacing many residents. The Tenderloin became a natural refuge for those seeking a new community, resulting in a significant presence of queer and trans individuals. It was within this era of profound change that the public's perception and understanding of gender identity was also evolving. Christine Jorgensen emerged as a trailblazer who shattered societal barriers. In the 1950s, she traveled to Denmark from the U.S. to undergo a groundbreaking gender reassignment surgery, and this propelled her into the forefront of public consciousness. Her bold actions sparked a wider conversation about gender identity, and it paved the way for a greater understanding and acceptance. Christine's influence went beyond the films that she was starring in, because she also inspired some of the trans women that were regulars at Jean Compton's. Alongside the progress of LGBTQ led organizations, churches in the area, and the support and results of Christine's influence, drag queens and transgender people, particularly transgender women, faced constant harassment from law enforcement, society, and even within the LGBTQ community itself. So it was here, in the heart of the Tenderloin District, Jean Compton's became a gathering place for these marginalized individuals seeking solace and connection with one another. The conflict intensified as a series of events unfolded, worsening the situation for the transgender community. Cross-dressing laws and three-piece laws both criminalized the expression of gender nonconformity. Regular police raids were conducted in bars and entertainment spaces, and this led to a further marginalization and mistreatment of drag queens and transgender individuals. In the documentary film Screaming Queens, The Riot at Compton's Cafeteria by Susan Stryker, which focuses on the transgender community in the Tenderloin District during the time of the Compton's Cafeteria riot. Several individuals were interviewed, and it revealed that a significant number of these women were sex workers, which they often referred to as hustling, due to facing job discrimination and systemic marginalization. Over time, many of these individuals stopped attempting to seek employment in other fields. I went out and tried to get a job in men's clothing. No, you're too effeminate. You're a f- You're a sissy. You're this. You're that. So I said, well, groovy. So I put on the clothes I usually wear, which is girls' clothes. I went out and tried to get a job as a woman. Yes. This doesn't work. You get a job, you work for a day or two, a week, a month, or whatever it boils down. Somebody comes along that recognizes you who prefers to be a hooker and a tramp, turns around and turns your name into the boss and says, like, so-and-so is such-and-such, and that's the end of that job. So finally you reach a point where you get disgusted with the whole damn bit and what you do is you turn around and you go out on the street and you find out that you can make a hundred bucks tonight and you say, well, the hell with it. Why should I be legitimate? Why should I be respectable? Why should I be anything? Only a select few were able to pass as cisgender and secure jobs as singers, dancers, or entertainers for the prominent nightlife in the Tenderloin District. The documentary also shed light on how beauty standards and race influenced the varying levels of harassment experienced by these individuals. 
The majority, if not all, of the entertainers interviewed were white, while those who hustled were disproportionately BIPOC. In an interview, Felicia Elizondo, LGBTQ plus activist, says, We never thought of looking for a job. All of the pretty entertainers were snobs. In addition to the police mistreatment and adversity when trying to gain employment and housing, drag queens and transgender people also experience transphobia within the LGBTQ plus community itself. Many trans women were unwelcome in gay bars, which solidified Jean Compton's cafeteria as a crucial meeting place where they could find acceptance and support. Now that we're all caught up, we're back in the Tenderloin District in 1966. It was then that the tension of all this abuse finally reached its boiling point on that hot August night. The drag queens and transgender community had enough. They stood up to fight back against the oppression they were facing. With Compton Cafeteria staff calling the police frequently on its clientele, they called once again that night reporting that some of their customers were being loud and uncontrolled. The exact date is unknown because there was no media coverage at the time, and San Francisco's 1960 police records no longer exist. But the police responded and arrived at Jean Compton's. When one of the officers attempted to arrest a trans woman, she threw a cup of coffee in his face. Then the cafeteria erupted with violence. Patrons said that they threw many items such as sugar shakers, tables, plates, anything that they could get their hands on at the police and at the windows, causing them to shatter. In order to request backup, the police retreated into the streets where the fighting continued. The riot resulted in damaging a police car and burning down a sidewalk newsstand. Elliot Blackstone, who was part of the San Francisco police at the time of the riot, said that there was unnecessary violence from cops on the night of the Compton's cafeteria riot, and he later becomes an advocate for the transgender community and an ally in the progress that San Francisco sees during this era. Over the following days, protesters picketed the cafeteria and smashed windows when the glass was replaced. After the riot, Compton's began to close at midnight and it eventually shut down in 1972, but the riot at Compton's cafeteria really served as a moment of liberation. It was a rupture in the status quo that could no longer be ignored, an act of defiance that served as an inspiration for future LGBTQ plus activism, and it really laid the foundation for the Stonewall riots that would occur three years later on the other side of the country. While the Compton's Cafeteria Riot was not widely reported, it became an important event in LGBTQ plus history, thanks to the dedicated efforts of Susan Stryker. Her work shed light on this pivotal moment, amplifying the voices and experiences of the transgender community. One individual who emerged from this movement was Tamara Cheen, a sex worker's right activist who played a significant role in advocating for justice and equality. Without the contributions and hard work of Susan Stryker, this story would continue to be hidden and would just be another lost LGBTQ plus story that was never documented. The Compton's Cafeteria Riot marked a crucial turning point in transgender activism. While immediate change may not have been achieved, it served as a powerful reminder that the struggle for LGBTQ plus rights extends beyond sexual orientation alone. The riot emphasized the importance of including and supporting transgender individuals, inspiring future generations to continue the fight for equality, and to recognize that there is no LGB without the T. We owe a debt of gratitude to our trans siblings for their courageous act of resistance. This has been the often untold story of the Compton's Cafeteria Riot, a defining moment in LGBTQ history. To learn more about this pivotal event and its impact, I encourage you to watch the documentary by Susan Stryker, Screaming Queens, The Riot at Compton's Cafeteria. I relied on it heavily for the research of this video as it provides an in-depth exploration of the riot and its significance shedding light on the voices and experiences of those who fought for justice. If you enjoyed this, please leave a like, comment, and share with someone that would enjoy this story. All of that stuff really helps out. Thank you so much for watching and until the next time, friend.